And welcome everyone to episode 36 of our NCAA Social Series. I'm Andy Katz. Pleased to be joined by Dr. Brian Hainline, the NCAA Chief Medical Officer. We're taping this just before the holiday. And uh, Dr. Hainline, I want to get a sort of a 30,000 foot view on a couple of topics. First, an update from your vantage point of overall in college athletics, uh, you know, making it to Thanksgiving, a lot of twists and turns. Some programs have shut down, some have come back. Everyone's experienced some form, it seems, and have been affected, obviously, by COVID-19. Uh, how would you assess where we are in terms of getting even just to this point? Well, it's been like a uh, day by day sort of journey, Andy. I mean, it's, it's, we're dealing with the societal issues where we see we're in a very high rate of infection really across the country, higher than we've ever seen before. And we're also witnessing that on college campuses that they're really getting a much better understanding of how to mitigate risk and especially within athletics. And so there were many who didn't think it would be possible to play any college football games. And although many have been canceled, there have been many more that have been played and, and actually they've been played successfully. So, and that also goes for, uh, for other sports, including indoor uh, women's volleyball. So, you know, we're taking it day by day, week by week, if you will, making certain that we're on a path that makes sense, that we're still assuring that, that you know, college sports can be played safely, and then really assessing it within the terms of uh, what's happening in our society. So, so it's interesting. It's, it's not like we're just plunging ahead and saying, wow, you know, let's just finish the season. We're just seeing what we can do. But clearly there is a different approach, and, and as in all in medicine, things evolve. And obviously we've had an unbelievable pace of getting a vaccine, which we'll get to momentarily. And hopefully at some point into our arms, as we've talked about many times, it's the vaccination, not the vaccine that can end something like this. Um, but in March, everything was shut down. We didn't know what we were dealing with. Um, now it seems like it's much more in the mitigation phase, even as you know, the numbers are skyrocketing across the country, not just in different pockets. There's definitely a feeling like, you know what, we're going to have to deal with this and we're not going to completely shut down and cancel all sports. Why do you think that is such a difference between November, December thinking versus last March? Well, I'll give you one really good example. So when we first started thinking of resocializing sport, we assessed all of the risk of transmission in sport and we looked at gymnastics and we said, that's a very high risk for transmitting the disease because we thought at that time that it was largely, uh, you know, surface transmission just as much as respiratory droplet. And now when we reclassified sport, we have gymnastics as a low risk sport. We're not concerned about surface transmission. Recall back then when we were first starting to talk about practice that we said, well, don't handle a football, don't handle a basketball. And, and so we understand much better what works. And even if, a society at large, things are evolving at a microcosm level. And this is really a metaphor for how we can do things in the, from a business point of view in sport. If you understand what to do to mitigate risk, and we have a much greater understanding, I mean, outdoors compared to indoors, indoors good ventilation compared to poor ventilation, masking and physically distancing at all times whenever feasible. I mean, just these little things make a profound difference. And, and now they're being instituted at every level of athletics. It, it's really like second hand, whereas at first it was, you know, geez, how do I do the mask again? And, you know, how do I measure those six feet? How do I make sure it's done? So a lot of things have become second hand that are really profoundly important for risk mitigation. Yeah, and I would also say that I, I think we've gotten to a point where the alternative is it's just not gonna happen and no one wants that again. Uh, I mean, I can bring it down even to the granule level. You know, I share your enthusiasm for tennis and now playing indoor tennis recreationally, um, at least where I live in the state of Connecticut and Rhode Island, if you want to play indoors, you have to wear a mask. And that just changed, obviously, within the last few weeks. If you don't, then you can't play. And I've found that with coaches here, especially in the indoor sports like basketball for men and women, um, while they don't like it, they realize if they don't mask up, they're not going to play. They're not going to coach. And I clearly have seen a shift in that attitude. How about from your vantage point when you've talked to all the stakeholders? Oh, there's no question. Your observation is correct, Andy. So it is, it is much more secondhand. I remember when 
we first talked about masking on the sidelines, it was like a radical concept. And, and yeah, now it's just an accepted part of, of, of what we need to do. And especially the basketball coaches. So they're in this sort of, uh, you, you know, they, they hit the wave when we were much better educated for football. There were still a lot of unknowns. And the basketball coaches understand everyone masks except when you're on the court and actually playing and that everyone does everything correctly 24 seven. And that's the only way that a season is gonna be pulled off. And, and you know what, look, COVID can always sneak in. It, 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 it's really, you know, it, it knows how to do that, but we also know how to prevent it from doing that. And so I think it's that, that combination of understanding COVID is ever present, but if we do things right, the chances of really minimizing spread is, is, is really pretty good. So we do still have some inconsistencies. Uh, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 are testing every day. It doesn't mean they're not going to have cases, as we've seen at Michigan State and Minnesota uh, and Cal and Arizona State, uh, just to name a few. So it still can get through, even though testing every day. There are others that are going to have to ramp up to at least three times a week as games get going. Um, what's the difference, though, in terms of testing every day versus at least three times a week when the virus, as you said, still finds its way to get in there? Well, it's a good question. The honest answer is, Andy, we don't know. So you, you can test three times a day and, and it may not make a difference because the only thing that really makes a difference most profoundly is behavior. And the behavior is probably more important for in, in the, all the times when you're not in athletics, when you know you can be involved in social situations or dining indoors or something like that, or in practice, you know, practice is a very important time. And just like when we looked at our concussion data, it's much lower in competition than it is in practice. Practice are the things that you can really control, but it's important in practice not to get sloppy, not to have team meetings without masking, not to hang around without masking. And so it's testing is important and the medical advisory group that we work with plus uh, uh, other other groups that have supported that they landed on the cadence of three times a week that that really should work. Big Ten and Pac-12 landed on every day, and and there are various reasons to, for that. You know, you also consider that initially the Big Ten and Pac-12 said they weren't going to do fall sports, and then when they came back, they said, well, we'll test every day. And so it's not an evidence-based statement, but it it makes some good sense. Um, does it make more sense than three times a week? Well, we don't know, but we're actually analyzing all of that data so that we will know going forward. Yeah, and Wisconsin was a great example of that. Test every day, come back, open the season, then they have to shut down for two weeks, come back, you know, and then they beat Michigan. So, I mean, you know, they navigated it and dealt with it. Um, the inconsistency, though, also of who sits. Great example, Michigan State. Tom Izzo gets it. He sits, but the team practices. Um, at Syracuse, Jim Beheim test positive, another case, they shut down. Uh, how do you deal with that inconsistency where there might be one case, maybe just a coach in that instance, and they don't have to completely shut down, and in other cases, one or two cases, and they're down for at least two weeks? Well, Andy, that's something that really is, you know how they say all politics is local, all contact tracing is local. And, and, and that's what's difficult to understand from the public point of view because they usually don't see that there are multiple, multiple municipalities doing contact tracing across different states and different states have different approaches. So there's not one national guidance for contact tracing in terms of how everything is done. Yes, there's the broad CDC guidance, but even that there's a lot of gray in there. So some contact tracers, they look at the situation and they will say, well, look, if if everyone was masked and there wasn't this really prolonged contact, well, we don't believe that everyone has to go in isolation, I'm sorry, in quarantine. Other contact tracers will say, well, we don't care if people were masked or not. There was close contact, we want all of those individuals in quarantine. And so even no matter what our guidance is in general, it comes down to what the public health officials decide is important. And that's why what we've told the membership is that get to know your local public health officials, understand their mindset, because they ultimately are the ones making the decisions, barring any sort of federal shutdown or state shutdown, really the decision-making is being made by the local municipalities. So I, I love that answer, because I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to coaches in the last six weeks or so that still want a national 
policy, a national mandate. But what you are saying right there is even if you or the NCAA said, this is what we're saying, you know, sit seven days, 10, 14, whatever, a local health department could say, no, we're overriding, we're in control in this municipality, and this is what we say. No, that's right, Andy. And, and even, you know, if you, if you go back and look at professional sports, when the NBA decided that they were going to create really what essentially was close to a perfect bubble, um, and so that allowed them to do certain testing to get out of quarantine and so forth, that's not because the NBA set that guidance. That's because they first had pre-approval from Orlando and from the state of Florida in terms of their public health officials. They presented the plan. And the NCAA, we can present a plan, but we can't get every single state in the country to align behind that. And the CDC won't formally endorse it. So that's, that's the difference. And so, you know, if you're talking about one event, US Open, or one uh, large concept, the NBA bubble, you can then align with the public health officials at the state and local level. But when you're talking about rolling out collegiate sport across the country, it's, it's actually not possible. So I know you didn't work in television, but that's a perfect segue because you dove right into uh, the major announcement um, in the middle of this month that the 2021 NCAA tournament will be held in one region, uh, not officially in the state of Indiana or the metro Indianapolis uh, yet, uh, although Dan Gavitt, the NCAA senior vice president, did say that the plan is still for the Final Four to be at Lucas Oil Stadium in early April. And so if that does happen, um, there's a good chance that it could be in the state of Indiana. So if that's the case, to have one set of guidelines, one state that you're dealing with, potentially one metro area, um, what did you think from a medical perspective about doing that to have this complex a tournament all in one region, if you will, essentially one place? Well, it just makes tremendous sense. And, and first, you know, really give a, a hats off and a congratulations where it's due to Danny Gavitt and Joanne Scott and, and, and their team. And, and, you know, just to the enormous amount of work to think about, geez, how are we going to do 12 sites? And when you're doing 12 sites, you're talking about 12 states. You're talking about state and local public health officials. You're talking about travel restrictions, potentially, or not. And so in, in, in the setting of, of where we're going nationally with increase in infections, um, it makes all the sense in the world medically to bring everything together in one site and to create a relative bubble. It can't be a perfect bubble like the NBA, because it's a different concept. I mean, a, a close comparison is like the US Open bubble where they brought two tournaments in, but you know, everyone wasn't staying inside one bubble. They still had to transport tennis players back and forth, but the transportation was really done in a very safe manner. The, there were just a handful of people on a large bus. Everyone was masked, everyone was distanced. The ventilation was great. So that would be the concept here. You, you hold March Madness and, and, and the Final Four in, in one place. You know, you can have a cadence, something like, you know, where teams play every other day. That's how the NBA did it. Um, and, and so you just make sure that it makes sense. But the important thing here, and it alludes, it, it's similar to what we talked about earlier, is that if you're going to do that, you want to make certain that the governor, the mayor, the state, and the city public health officials, they all align on the plan. And, and so the players aren't going to be going out into the city at night. They aren't gonna be exposed to the fans. They're going to be really in a, a fairly isolated environment under very strict protocols that yes, they're NCAA protocols, but importantly, they would be NCAA protocols that are approved by and even modified or enhanced by the local and state public health officials. So it really is a, a teamwork concept that everyone has to be on the same page for it to work. Yeah, and actually, when you add in Dayton for the first four, and then the final four, I think it goes up to 14 uh, different places uh, to put the whole tournament together. And, and I think the key word would be controlled environment. We've heard that term before, very much like you said about the French Open, the US Open, events like that, where you're not in one area, and you can't obviously bubble a city, and I guess what I'm thinking is, and we'll get more in details into December, in December about this, you know, maybe it's the hotel, the arena, and your practice site if there are two different places. And you really can only go to those three places. You're not going out to restaurants. If you are in a tier one, maybe you're a tier two. Um, you know, is that what you're thinking, that, that 
controlled environment, select places, and all controlled travel in between each one? I think that's a fair way to say it. It, 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 it. Another way is that every single thing that every person involved in this does is tightly prescribed and it must be adhered to. That's the only way this could work. And so, you know, even if you're in a hotel, you're, you're in your hotel room, you don't mingle, you don't go, go downstairs, you don't go into the roommate's hotel room to play cards or what have you. So everyone really needs to follow the protocol and it, and it needs to be enforced. So um, I think controlled environment really is a, the, the perfect word, maybe hyper-controlled. Um, so one other thing I just want to get back to when we talked about the contact tracing, just put a bow on it. Um, look, we, we all you know, have seen like what's happened with the NFL, for example. Um, so dispel this for me. For when they see uh, a one player or two players uh, who sit a game or two, and the NFL has been, you know, out, you know, they've sort of put out their COVID-19 lists, if you will, uh, but the team doesn't shut down for the most part. There have been obviously some games moved, but they can get away with one or two players sitting and not the whole team. Yet in basketball, you know, we have seen full teams sit for 10 to 14 days. What would be the difference? Because I've had this question between the NFL and college basketball. Yeah, so it also re, it, it's important to note that the NFL, so they work in certain states and they presented their protocols to those states. And when, when their players when, don't go into quarantine, for example, they don't go into quarantine for football, but they are in quarantine for the rest of society, which is, which is something that's important to note. But you know, basketball and, and football are, are very different. And, and if you look at the CDC uh, definition of a close contact, so it's 15 minutes over a period cumulative of 24 hours of close contact. And football, the contact, it's, you know, it, it's very sudden. It's for, you know, maybe a second or so at a time. And, and then you're away. And, and it's outdoors. And, and so one can argue and you can argue, you know, reasonably successfully that a close contact in football during a football game is much different than a close contact in basketball game. The truth of the matter is, is that, you know, we don't understand completely um, what it's going to be like playing in indoor basketball. We have a sense from the NBA, but, but again, by the time they were playing competition, they were really in a, in a virus-free environment, essentially. And, and so that's going to be the challenge because indoors is very different than outdoors. And we know that some arenas have different ventilation systems than others. And, and so, you know, just erring on the side of safety, being cautious, being reasonable, that's the big difference between basketball, collegiate basketball and, and the NFL and, 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 and why we have to consider shutting down more people when, there, when there's been, you know, even one or two people that have tested positive on the team. And I also want to just clearly state this, that contact tracing, not someone who's positive, but contact tracing, uh, as it stands now, you still cannot test out of. Is that correct? So that's correct. So it means that if you've had a close contact, you're not tested positive. I'm, not, I'm negative, but I've been with someone or near but, someone who's determined to be positive. Yeah, so if... Um, if, you, if you're in quarantine, so we don't have a way now of testing out of quarantine, and if you're positive, we don't have a way of testing out of being positive, except one situation. That is, if you have an antigen test and it's positive, it's always followed or can be followed by a PCR lab-based test, and the result of that test is uh, what is definitive. There are some conferences that have developed protocols for testing out of a positive test, so which means while you're in isolation and waiting for that. But that testing out, so we, we know the story when, when Coach Saban, when he had his first positive test. And then according to the SEC protocol, you have to have three consecutive lab-based PCR tests separated by at least 24 hours that are all negative. But they also received approval from their local public health officials to do that. And there are some states that said, we won't allow that to happen. So even that varies. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I've had a number of coaches who tell me, well, you know, how are we going to have a season if they have to sit 14 days? And the reality is that that particular school may be disrupted, but the entire membership or 330, you know, 30, if, if all of them end up playing, um, they all may not be affected. And unfortunately, that is the reality that we're dealing with. One last topic before I just want to end with vaccines, and that is the month of December. 
Um, this has been talked about for quite some time. The majority, if not all, I can't give you 100%, but the majority of schools are not gonna have their students on campus. If they were on campus or are, it'd be only at the beginning of December, then the break happens. So in terms of controlled environments, um, how good are these potential environments where the basketball team literally may be the only people in that community of a campus uh, to then practice and play a game? All right, so you have basketball teams or maybe researchers who need to be in the lab, and, and, and so you really have specialized students, um, if you will. And, and it's, it's easier to control the environment when you, know, you, you have less people and there's less chance for social interactions with others. And, and, you know, and, and you know, when you think about it, if you're on a basketball team and you are really highly committed to doing everything right, but you know, being in a dormitory is, is, is not risk-free and, and sometimes you just get into a social situation. So yeah, the less people and the more that everyone's on the same page, the much easier it is to mitigate risk. All right, so vaccines, the news has been great, uh, but there's still some time, obviously. Uh, you know, we've now got at least multiple vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, that are on the horizon, uh, waiting official approval. Uh, but in terms of the timeline, athletes, I would think, are further down the pecking order in terms of who would receive it. Uh, you know, clearly it doesn't appear to be before March Madness. So what would be your advice in terms of for student athletes that think when they hear this news, oh, my God, this is great. I'm going to get this vaccine. We're going to have our season without, you know, any hindrance and so on versus slow the roll. It's coming, but it just may not be yet for you. Yeah. So the best advice is, look, the vaccine, it's, it's incredibly good news, right? I mean, and, and even Dr. Fauci said that, that this is we're we're moving in a way that, that he hadn't expected. And, and so we're all excited about this, but it takes a phenomenal infrastructure to deliver the vaccines to this country. And you have to ramp up the number of vaccines, but, but it's also critically important that to deliver it, you have to be at a certain temperature, which is really hard to maintain. And then, you know, assuming that we have a, um, that, that uh, President-elect Biden is, 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 is overseeing, you know, the, the, the rollout of this, um, I, he has pledged, and, and it makes sense that there's going to be a phenomenal emphasis on infrastructure, and part of that is how you can deliver vaccine. And most people predict that it, it's going to be rolling out uh, through the summer. So, um, basketball student athletes and, and students in general are not going to be at the top of the priority list. And so, it's important not to let your guard down. It's even more important than ever to stay really vigilant because once you let your guard down a little bit and say, oh, well, there's gonna be a vaccine anyway, the season could be shot. So now is the time to uh, maintain exceptional, exceptional discipline. I, I used an analogy the other day, you know, for those who have run marathons, we're at the 20 mile mark in the marathon. You know, we, we see the light at the end of the tunnel but this sometimes is the most difficult time. We have to go into a different place of spiritual and emotional and physical energy and renewal and commitment to get to that finish line. And being at the 20 mile mark, you're only halfway through. And so we're so close, but we have to look at it like we're only halfway through and we need to really stay exceptionally disciplined and focused. So I'll take your analogy one step further. In the three that I ran in Boston, New York and Paris, I cramped at mile 20 and the final six in each one of those was brutal. So uh, yes, I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, we are still not there yet, but we can see it. Uh, but we uh, have to assume that it's not coming for us here in the short term. And so yes, we have to be extremely vigilant going forward and know that it will get better. But this season, you're just gonna have to expect that you're gonna have to go through the, the same protocols. Uh, most importantly, stay safe, Dr. Hainline, and. Uh, I know we're going to get more and more details uh, as the weeks and months to come about March Madness, and we can address all those as we get deeper into what the protocols will be. And hopefully we will have a regular season uh, with the majority of teams playing at least a minimum of 13 games to get to March Madness and deliver the tournament that I know we all think is one of the best in the American sporting calendar, really in the world. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, as always, we appreciate all your engagement as well. Stay safe, everyone. We'll talk again next week.